She is currently serving a 10-year sentence on the charges of unauthorized use of a movable, illegal possession of stolen things, possession of a firearm by a convicted felon, possession with intent to distribute a controlled dangerous substance, possession of methamphetamine, possession of clonazepam, and possession of alprazolam, uh, an illegal transmission uh, sentenced on August the 11th of 2021. Uh, the last sentence of the illegal transmission is uh, February the 2nd of 2022. That was a lot of information, but is all of that basically correct? Yes, sir. Uh, Ms. Abel, your case has been assigned to Ms. Jackson. She'll be the one to begin our interview process. Would you please answer any questions she may have? Yes, sir. Good morning. How old are you, Ms. Abel? I'm 35. And how much time have you actually served on your 10 year sentence? Um, well, about this time, I've been incarcerated 18 months. Um, before that, I, I did five months here, four months here, you know, little little times on the 10 year. This is the most time I've done. Was it because of, okay, the, the little snippets of time, uh, was that time you served prior to bonding out on the charges? Yes, ma'am. So we can say maybe you have two, two and a half years yeah. after present on the sentence? Yes, ma'am. Um, you know, it's obvious from looking at your charges, Ms. Abrier, that you have a serious drug abuse history, that you've got a serious drug problem. You yes, agree with that? Yes, ma'am. Talk to us about that. Tell us uh, when you started using drugs, uh, how old you were, and the type of drugs typically used. Um, I started doing drugs when I was probably about 20, 25, and um, it, it was meth. That was that was the, the most common drug that I used. And, um, you know, it just, it's one of those addictions that it was, it was hard for me to get off of. Um, you know, did you graduate from high school? I got my, my GED. In on the street or in prison? No, um, at home. Why did you stop going to school? Uh, I, I was young and I, I had fallen behind in school and I, I just, I, I decided to get my, my GED instead of complete high school. What, what, what grade had you reached before you dropped out? A junior, I was a junior in high school, 11. Um, so from the time you left high school to the time you started your drug use, what was going on with you? Well, before, um, I was, I was in college for a little while, um, yeah. at South Louisiana Community College. And, and how, how long did that last? Um, two semesters. I was working, I was working and going to school. Um, what happened to stop going to school? because I was going to school at night and I was working during the day and it just became too much. So I, I dropped out of college and I started working full time. On what? Ma'am. What kind of work? Um, at the time I was waiting tables and I worked um, for Montfort oil field company in Lafayette. Um, and it just, it was too much. I was trying to go to school, hold a couple of jobs. Who were you living with? Um, at the time, my mom. Okay. Uh, I'm sure your mom would have supported you while you were in school. I'm trying to understand why you would choose a waitressing job that doesn't pay very much to finishing your education. I mean, it, it was a, a decision that, you know, uh, I regret today. But, you know, I, I can't go back. I think I'm asking, it seems odd to me that you wouldn't start drug use until 25. Uh, I mean, it, that, that's when it, it, it really got bad. I mean, when I was in, when I was okay. in my younger years, I, I smoked marijuana. Okay, what else? 
And I think that's where, you know, that's whenever I first got introduced to drugs. Um, and then I, I stopped doing that. And, uh, you know, I, I worked little jobs here and there. Then I, I really, when I, I found meth, it just, everything fell apart. My whole life fell apart. And who, how did you get introduced to meth? Um, you know, just the, it, it was me, but it was, you know, the wrong crowd you know, knowing the wrong people and the, the bad decisions that I made. Now, um, you're, you're serving a lot of time because of probation and parole violations being revoked. Yes, ma'am. Uh, why was it difficult for you to comply with the conditions of your supervision? Well, I, the, the city that I'm from is... Um, is not a great place for me. Uh, I know a lot of people and I have a lot of history there. And um, it, just being there is, is a trigger for me. Um, you, as part of your probation or your parole, were you ever ordered to undergo substance abuse treatment? Um, I, was, uh, I was in drug court and I, I couldn't complain. Oh, well. Let's talk about that. When, when did you go into drug court? Um, it was in 2019. I think it was 2019. What parish was that? It was in Lafayette, the, the parish that I'm from. And how long did you stay in drug court? Um, for about four months. Four months. Uh -huh. Why did you why did you end up leaving or getting put out? Uh, you know, going back to the same the same life that I, that I lived before, in the same town that I lived in before. Oh no, a lot of people live in Lafayette. It's not like Lafayette, some little small place. No, you absolutely know, not. Major, you know, pretty major city, and a lot of people who were in drug court also were in Lafayette. So I think we need to stop. Blaming it on Lafayette. No, it's it's not like it was me. It was me. It was the people that I was you know, that I chose to be friends with, and it was the way I, you know, I, I mean, I, I don't have the answer. So what, did you just stop going to drug court? Did you test frequently uh, for substances? Tell me what what caused you to be removed from drug court. I. Um, I, I test. I tested free, frequently for meth, and um, that you know it. It just got to a point where I, I was doing. I was not doing what drug court needed me to do. Did you only have one stint in drug court? Yes, ma'am. Did you ever go to any other substance abuse programs while on supervision? Um, well, like meetings and things like that. Meetings or inpatient treatment? Um, I went to, uh, um, I went to an in-treatment patient for two weeks. Okay, let's stop right there. Uh, was this before or after you were uh, removed from drug court? No, this was before I was removed from drug court. This is while I was on drug court. And I get in the last thing. This is while I was in drug court. And you were sent to an inpatient substance abuse treatment program? Yes, ma'am. Uh, and you only stayed there two weeks, is that correct? Yes, ma'am. Uh, what happened there? Um, I, I left. Uh, it, was, it was a decision that I made. Um, I had a visitation with my daughter. And uh, I decided to leave with her. Why? Okay, what do you think would have been in the best interest of your daughter? To leave with her or to stick out the program and get better for her? Well, definitely to stick out the program and get better for her. That's not what I did. And uh, since being incarcerated, 
and we gone through any substance abuse treatment programs since they departed. Not any substance abuse programs. I was in living in balance and um, anger management. Um, Let's talk about living in balance. Yes, ma'am. Talk about that. Um, living in balance. Uh, I, I took this class in Lafayette Parish while I was incarcerated there at the very beginning of my sentence. And, um, you know, it, it, it kind of told me, it, you know, showed me a couple of things that, that I was doing wrong, you know, the, the decisions that I was making. making all the all the bad choices that I've made throughout life that has gotten me here and it you know it's given me better a better understanding of why I continue to make these choices tell us why tell us what you learned about why you continue to make those choices uh, I think a lot of it is fear, um, you know, after, after so long of, uh, you know, living, living as an addict, you know, it, it becomes a numbing, a numbing mechanism. It's a coping mechanism and it's a very horrible choice because it destroys lives. It destroys my life, everybody that I love. It's affected everybody around me. And, um, you know, it, it, it just showed, it showed me a lot of things that I didn't understand before. Well, let me ask you this, uh, Ms. Andrea. Do you honestly believe, and I want you to look deeply within yourself, because, you know, some of the biggest lies we tell is one we tell. Do you honestly believe that after 18 months, you are equipped to get out of prison with the ability to, to not fall back into all of Well, that's one of my biggest, my biggest fears. Uh, you know, I, I worry about it every day. It, it's a constant, a constant thought. You know, um, can I get out and 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 be the person that I want to be? Um, I think I have a good chance here where I'm at. I have a great job. Um, I have a bed in a sober living house. Uh, you know, if if I were to make parole, and I have a great support system with the with the friends that I've made at the job that I'm at in this house. I'm about the job. Um, I work at Neighbors. Um, I'm a machine operator there, and I love it. I work with great people. We have a great staff, and it's one of our HR ladies who actually um, found the bed for me in one of the sober living houses. And, and where is Neighbors? Um, neighbors is in West Monroe off a of, um, cross commercial drive. Uh, it, it's a, we make cookie dough uh, for Nestle. Mm -hmm. And it's a great job. It's been a great experience. I love the work and I love the people that I work with. They are so um, positive. They're just a positive group of people to be around. And they, they want the best for me. And it's, it's been amazing. I'm glad to hear that you have a job that you love and you have that support system. But again, you know, you, you've been involved in drugs for a long time. And you've stumbled quite a bit on your journey to recovery. So how do you think, what's 
steps do you think you should take if you were to be released early to make sure that you don't decide to leave a sober living house, that you don't get lonely for your family and want to go back to Lafayette, where you say that's a trigger for you. So tell us why you think you would be able to be successful this time when you haven't been able to do it in the past. Well, I, I feel like, um, you know, I, I'm in a different frame of mind now. I, I actually have so many positive things going for me right now. And I think um, that's the, the biggest thing that's going to keep me, you know, striving to do better. Um, you know, like I said, you know, this job that I'm at, I plan on keeping this job and, you know, building a life here. And, you know, with the Sober Living House, it's going to give me a support system that I don't think I ever, I ever reached out for before. And now I want to. You ever been in a Sober Living House? No, ma'am. I know that there are people in Sober Living Houses who still use drugs and they bring drugs into the facility. You aware of that? I am aware of that. I am aware of that. But, um, you know, just, I think that that's one thing that, you know, it's always going to be a, a constant, it's going to be a struggle. It's, I don't think it's ever going to be easy for me, but I think, you know, um, making the right choices and, and setting myself up in the right way, I think I have a better chance of doing, you know, a long, a long been in this work for job for four months. So what would be the problem then with you continuing in the situation that you're in, getting more time of sobriety under your belt and continuing to work uh, in your work with this job? Well, I plan on continuing to work. I, I'm just, I feel like I'm, I, you know, of course I'm ready. Of course I'm ready to, to get out of prison. Well, if you want to get out, then you're ready to get, get out of two different things. I understand what you want to get out. Right. But what is ready to get out is a whole different thing. Right. Mm -hmm. Be glad you enjoy your job. Four months is not really a long time. Right. And with this job, a lot of things can happen. You might be layoffs. And you might be the one that got laid off. And then you've lost that thing that you think is going to keep you on track. So it's got to be more than just a job. It is. It, it, it is. You know, I, I have a daughter. I have a, uh, you know, a, a four-year-old daughter, and and she's another reason that you know uh, I'm ready to get out of prison. Um, she's with my mom right now. Uh, and, okay, let me ask you this: If you were to move to West Monroe, where would your daughter be? Well, my daughter right now she would stay with my mom, and you know I would build a foundation here, and that's something that me and my mom have been talking about, and um, you know to to get myself healthy for her. I have been working, you know, I, I've been sober for 18 months, but I've been incarcerated. So, so you can only, you know what, you can only, yeah. but Fine. it's a start for me. And yeah. you know, the, the next step, it's, it's gonna be me building a life for her to where I'll be able to provide that life for her. And that's what I'm, I'm just, I'm so ready to do that. I'm so ready to get that opportunity to get that chance. Uh, is there anyone in the room with you from the staff? Um, yes, ma'am. Uh, who are you? Would you and they yes, identify yourself? Yes, ma'am. Deputy Marshan. Deputy Marshan, do you have any personal knowledge 
Have we paid there? Uh, from what I've seen, she's been with us since May. No write-ups, no incidents, and Corporal Powell at the Work Release Center uh, had nothing but good things to say about her. All right, thank you. Miss uh, Xavier, um, that's all I have. Thank you very much. Thank you. Ms. Xavier, let me ask a couple of questions. Who was your judge in uh, drug court? Um, judge Edwards. He started out as my judge. Judge Edwards, I know Judge Edwards very well. He's very lenient. Mm -hmm. Very strict, but he's very lean. He would have given you every opportunity to continue in drug court. He did. And, and I, he assume, did. I assume he did. He did. He did. Now, you were in a pretty controlled environment in his drug court. I he was. watched you closely. And when he put you in jail for sanctions, you were in a jail where the sheriff was working with with him to make sure everything was straight, try to get you work and all of those things, wasn't it? That, that. You got a one, they got one of the best drug programs in the state of Louisiana. You, and you, you couldn't do that. Uh, I have the same fears that Judge Jackson has, and, and, and that is, I'm not sure that you're equipped to be out there. Your mind is in the right place. You're heading in the right place. I'm just worried uh, that you might fall back into some of those old times. So, and I know Judge Jackson talked about this, so I want to ask you a little bit. You're going to live in a sober living. Home, but what, is, what is your plan to stay sober? What are you going to do? What positive things do you think you need to do to stay sober? I know well, you talk about staying away from Lafayette, staying away from people, places, and things. That's one thing. But what will you do uh, to stay sober? Well, you know, I, I plan on getting involved in, in this program. And that's where, you know, uh, that's a completely new thing for me. Because in drug court, I, I didn't. I didn't participate. I didn't want to participate in drug court. It was just, it was just a sentence. And now, uh, you know, I, how old is your daughter again? My daughter, uh, um, she was two. She was two. Where was she living? Um, with me. She was with me while I was in drug court. That wasn't reason enough to stay sober. You know, uh, she is, she is reason enough. I just wasn't, uh, I wasn't mentally ready for it. And I had never had enough sobriety to understand the difference. And these past 18 months has been a, such a mind blowing experience for me because I, you know, I, I've thought about everything that I've, I've given up and everything that, you know, all the, all the chances and opportunities I've missed. Let me ask you this. You say the last 18 months have been a mind-blowing experience. What has been a mind-blowing experience? Sitting in jail and thinking about everything you've lost out on or problems that you take? Um, what, no. what, is, what has been the experience, the mind-blowing experience that thinks that, that gives you now the ability to be able to stay so? Because this is the first time I've been sober for this amount of time. And it, I, I just see uh, the potential that I have and the opportunities that I, I've been given, I am, I'm so thankful for. And I don't want to ruin the, you know, the, the, the life that I, I really want to build. And I've been given such such a great opportunity and you know i know anything can happen with jobs but i mean just i, I feel like i've been so blessed with everything that i've been given with the, with the tools that you know uh, the sobriety house is willing to offer me that i've never had that i've never taken the time to really use and that's what i want to put in place all the you know uh, to participate in the meetings to to get to know these people 
and to, to live a better life and to be a better me. Because they there, you, you've talked about your daughter. Your record suggests you have two children. Do you have two children? I do. Okay. What's, who's the other child? Where's the other child? My, my son is with his father. How old is your son? He's 16. 16. And where was he living when? You were doing all your drugs and income cord, et cetera. How long um, was he with? He was, uh, he was with me and my mom. I was living with my mom, and um, my mom and my dad, and they they helped me with him. You basically had custody of both of your children until you got into real serious trouble, went to jail, got taken away. Thank you, Ms. Uh, Ray Bear. Uh, is there anything you'd like to say to the board before we vote? Um, you know, I just would like an opportunity to to build a life here, and you know, I hope y'all give me that chance. I'm just asking for a chance to to start over, to start fresh, and to to build the life that I know I can have. And you know, I. I know I'll have the support that that I need, and I think I am in a, a place where I'm ready to to appreciate that and use that. Thank you very much. Jackson, Ms. Aber, I've heard everything you said, and and I can see that you believe what you're telling me. Stuff. But you know, from you, when did you, do you know when your big time day is? Yes, it's in it's when, in April. In April, April 16th of 2023, a little less than seven months from now. Now, for me, uh, if I were, if my life had been destroyed by drugs, and I had failed multiple times in maintaining sobriety. I, I would like to think that I would recognize that the situation that I'm in right now is the best place for me to be. I think had you really understood the nature of your addiction and how, you know, how aggressive that addiction was, you would have said to yourself, you know what, I'm in a good place right now. I'm in a work release program. I'm working on myself, and I can stick this out for another seven months to make sure that I'm in the best place I can be to be successful. You see, you want to get out too soon. You're too anxious to get out. But showed me you don't recognize how difficult getting out is going to be. I don't think you're ready yet. I really don't. You're headed in the right direction, and I commend you for that. Your thinking is starting to change. But for me, where you are right now is the best possible situation that you can be in. Don't be so anxious to get out. Be anxious to get back. And so my goal today would be to deny uh, your early release because of the proximity to your big time day. And I feel you still need some more work to do on yourself. You know, a mature person would have said, you know what, this is not a bad situation. I'm clean, I have a job, I'm making a foundation. I can do this for seven months. Because if you can't do it for seven months, how are you going to do it for the one to do that? So my goal today is to deny, but encourage you to keep working on yourself, keep excelling in your job, and earning their trust and their confidence so that when you get out and they're willing to give you a job, then you're better situated to be successful this time. Good luck to you. 
But my vote today will be to be. Thank you, Ms. Jackson. Ms. Avery, I enjoyed listening to your enthusiasm about the job and the people that you work with and your excitement about the sober living house. Um, and that's a good sign. Uh, you've been really thinking about working on you. I do agree with Mrs. Jackson because of the proximity of your big time date. I do believe you benefit from remaining in the job that you love um, um, and maintaining sobriety until the good time release date. I would suggest or ask that we add to the good time release certificate uh, that you, once released, you do attend at least a minimum of two AA meetings per week. Thank you well. Good luck. Uh, Ms. Hebert, um, the reason I asked you about Judge Edwards, uh, I know Judge Edwards well because I was a drug court judge for 14 years myself. And I've seen people in your position just in the position you're in today. And I believe deep in my heart that you believe what you're saying today about You've got it licked, and you're going to be able to do this. Uh, it's not that easy. Addiction is a disease. It's not something that you just get over. It's something that you're going to have to work on for the rest of your life. And I'd like to see you in the next seven months uh, do well on your job, but also read up on AA meetings, read up on what you're going to accomplish when you get out. You're going to have to go to AA meetings for the rest of your life or some sort of meeting like that for the rest of your life to be able to stay clean. Uh, I don't mean to scare you in any way, but I can tell you I've looked at people exactly like you, exactly in your position in my drug court. And when they got out thinking exactly the way you're thinking, many of them succeeded, many of them died from overdoses. They weren't quite ready. And I think Judge Jackson's observations of you uh, that you're anxious to get out, but we're just not sure you're ready. I hope you take advantage of the next seven months uh, and, and, and realize, don't be disappointed today. Look at this as an opportunity to be able to build on the wonderful foundation that you've set up. So you can be with your daughter and hopefully with your son too. So you've got three votes to uh, to deny your parole, but adding on the condition uh, once you are released that you do at least two AA meetings per week. I'm sure your supervisor will require that, but we're going to make sure that that happens. So good luck to you. I mean, you're on the right track. Keep it up. Uh, we can close out at uh, Washita. Uh, Thank you very much, uh, staff there. You're welcome. Well, I think Ms. Jackson definitely hit that one on the head. Uh, you know, this hearing took place on 8-30-2022, and she's out. She, We haven't seen her again, so maybe she is sticking out of trouble, and I certainly hope we don't see her again. She had a... <laughs> When she was wanted on 2021, I guess it's for this this most recent charge. Um, it was quite a lot on lawful wire fraud, and and they they did say it was a lot when they went through all of the charges. Um, it certainly, you know, she's uh, she's been through the ringer, and I think that. You know, Miss Jackson can be so thorough and she really drills down into it. It's like, why do you want to get out so quickly? You only have so much more time. Why don't you put in the work? And of course, everyone wants to get out, but we have seen, you know, we don't need to be a drug court judge for 800 years, or as Miss Jackson was uh, on the bench for what, 20 years, something years, I forget. Um, we just, we watch enough of these hearings and we being, begin to realize, yeah, I mean, there's like, you get a sense when people feel like they're at rock bottom and they're ready. And you get a sense when people just feel eager, desperate to get out. And I, I, uh, it did seem certainly to make a lot more sense to just run out your time, uh, build that success 
And when you're ready to get out, get out. And 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 probably better don't have, you know, they could have thrown a ton of parole uh, restrictions on her, which would have made her life much more difficult. Like she, they could have said, okay, you'll get out, but do 90 AA meetings in 90 days. And here's your curfew. And he, wear, wear a, a scram bracelet and all these things. And then she might be like, oh, maybe I should have just stayed at work. Who else always gets a kick out of that Star Wars poster in the background? I can never get bored of it. I'll tell you that. Um, I don't know what else to say. You know, the, the information I shared is kind of what it is. Uh, Richard did share a lot of different things. She has like a shoplifting in 2016. And um There's just a lot of different booking reports and stuff like that. I don't think this one is, uh, but we can do another hearing. I just want, I don't have much to add to this, but I am happy to hear, to share, to hear, to share that. Wait a minute. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. She was initially booked March 14, 2021. So she really hasn't served that much time. Um, yeah, that's it. So <laughs> with that, I'll let you go and uh, well, we'll move to the next hearing, but I'm sorry if there, there, we had some lagging problems. My internet was a little unstable and I oftentimes don't watch the hearings while I listen, I, I, I'll put on a Bluetooth headset and I'll listen while it's going on. And this way I can multitask, right? I can. Uh, do the dishes or something, right? There's the idea of sitting here for 40 minutes um, and listening without being able to get other things done wouldn't be possible with the amount of hearings that I cover. So I, you know, it's sometimes hard to catch on all those things. So anyways, let's move to the McDonald's classified as a third felony offender. He has a parole eligibility date of August 14th of 2021 an adjusted good time date of April the 15th of 2023, and a full term date of November the 8th of 2033. He is currently serving 16, a 16-year 16 sentence on two separate fourth fence DWI charges. Is that accurate, Mr. Uh, McDonald? Yes, sir. Mr. McDonald, the case has been assigned to Mr. Pete Freeman. Mr. Freeman will begin uh, our, our interview process with you. Would you please answer any questions he may have? Yes, sir. McDonald, uh, how old are you? 45, sir. Uh, how long have you been in jail on this charge? August 3rd will be three years. Um. What is your education level? I have graduated high school. I have some college and uh, Votech school, sir. Um, but, uh, how, many, how many DWIs do you think you have over the course of your life? I believe altogether it was six. Uh, have you ever took it, taken any long-term treatment? Well, um, this past time when I got locked up, uh, Judge Irwin, I, he, he gave me a bond, but he made it a stipulation of my bond to go to a, uh, a live-in treatment center, which I went to Bethel Colony in New Orleans. It's a six-month uh Treatment. Okay. Uh, what did you learn from that treatment? I learned that there are many other ways of dealing with my problems besides alcohol. What are your problems? Well, just life problems in general, sir. I, I did that in the past. I took the wrong way and 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 dealt with my problems with alcohol. What, what, what are your triggers? What, what did they teach you? What are your triggers? What, 
what causes you to go drink and drive? Yeah. I do drink. Um, depression, um, things going on with the family. Okay. Um, yeah, you know, what's the problem with being on supervision? You was on supervision. You got out uh, of a 10 year sentence. You got out on, uh, let's see, it says, uh, on, in 05 and it got revoked in 2013. You paroled again in 2015. Got revoked 2019. And in all of your rap sheets, if you can tell, it's mostly because of your alcohol problem. Yes, sir. What, what took you so long to, to start trying to not drink? I mean, you did good while you out on bond. I, I'm looking at that. Yes, sir. Well, like I said, I, I've learned what, why it took me so long. I, I, I guess I have a very hard head, stubborn. So I guess it just, I don't know, it took me a little while to wake up. But thank God I finally did. Yeah, I do too. Because uh, Do you realize what could have been the consequences of some of your actions? Yes, sir. Very much so. So what what could have happened? You tell me what what could have happened the way you would drive. I could have hurt myself. I could have killed somebody else on the road. Any of those things. Right. I mean, I looked at your blood alcohol levels, 0 0.225, 0 0.187. That, that's pretty high up there. That's not just a couple of beers. Did you drink beer or whiskey? Uh, a little of both. What, what would be your sobriety plan if we, we uh, let you out? So I am uh, planning on paroling out to Mississippi. I have family there. My parents are there. My wife will be there. Um, there is a lot there that I can do and have plans to do that would keep me away from wanting to drink. What, are, what is that? Tell me, tell me what's going to keep you away from wanting to drink. Well, for one, I just, I, I know that I don't need to do that anymore. Um, I have a lot of family support there. Um, I have a job to go to. Um, I mean, I just, there, there's a lot of things that I realize that I can do now that I don't, I, I don't have to drink. Okay. You, you still had to hit what I was trying to get at. I mean, what is your sobriety plan? I mean, are you planning on attending AA, NA, any of those type of things? Or are you just thinking? Well, sir, I, was, I was attending AA before I was incarcerated. Um, I plan on doing the same. Uh, there's a, a, it's a, it's a very small place where I'm going to be moving to. And there is, uh, my church there that I'll be going to and also work. Um, the risk is moderate. Uh, you have strong law enforcement opposition. Uh, you have a good time date coming up early next year. Uh, tell me why I should think about letting you go right now. Tell me, try to convince Pete Freeman to let you out of jail right now. Well, I know that I have made mistakes in the past, and I'm very aware of that. But I also know that I have changed my life around. And I know that I can be a productive part of society. Um, I have my family to take care of that I, I definitely plan on doing. Um, I have a house to go to. My parents are there. They're getting older. 
I want to take care of them. Like they've been there for me my whole life. And I, I just, I, I want to be there for my family minus all this other stuff, including drinking. Okay. How many children do you have? Two? Yes, sir. Two girls. How old are they? They are, my oldest is 26 and my youngest is 22. Okay. Are they still in your life at this time? Yes, sir. And my oldest daughter has had two grandchildren since I've, I've been here. Okay. And uh, how long have you been married? Oh, 15, 15 years, 16 years. Chicken ass. <laughs> <laughs> I missed that one by too much. Uh, anyway, uh, I have no further questions, Chairman. Uh, I, I have a, a couple of questions. Um, uh, you say you went to, Judge Irwin sent you to a program. What program was that? It was called Bethel Colony. It's in New Orleans. It's a uh, faith-based. Uh, what did you learn? How did you learn to stay sober there? Well, sir, they include... Um, I hate to I hate to use the word religion, but your faith in God and tying that into staying sober, which to me is a very big part of that, along with the meetings and a. Um, Have you done the twelve steps? Yes, sir. Tell me about step number five. Remember what step five is? Step five is when you talk specifically to one person. Who did you talk to or did you do that step? I, I, I had a, uh, what is, uh, each person has a counselor there. No, no, I'm not talking about a counselor. Step five is that you are to seek out an individual and discuss with them your issues. Have you done, did you do that? Yes, sir. Quite a few what times. Did I did it with my counselor. I did it with my, I've done it with my wife. I've done it with my family. So why is this time different? <clears throat> well, I just, I, I have it in my head and I have it in my heart that I don't even need to drink anymore. You've never thought that before after having six DWIs? Yes, sir, I have. But to be honest with you, before this happened, I, I never really was that serious about it. Well, you're doing 17 years. That makes you serious. Yes, sir. Yes, it does. What's the longest you've done in prison before this stint? Three years. How much? Three years. And how did you feel when you got out after three years? Did you think you'd go back to drinking? To tell you the truth, no, sir. Well, I mean, you're telling me the same thing now. Mr. Mr. Freeman asked you what your plan for sobriety is. Let's assume you get out tomorrow. You walk out tomorrow. What's the first thing you're going to do to stay sober? You know, go to uh, find an AA meeting that's local. And why? Because that's the um, that's the easiest thing to get to that will help me in that way. Do you have any hobbies? Yes, sir. What are your hobbies? Um, I actually I have a garden at home that I like to where, where I'm going to be paroling out to. And um, it's actually, I'm, I'll be out in the middle of the woods. <laughs> Where are you originally from? I'm from Baton Rouge. Baton Rouge? Baton Rouge. Yes, like sir. Fish? yes, sir. I like to hunt also. <laughs> Hunting, fishing. Uh, I like to do those same things. Everywhere I go, there's alcohol. Right. I'm going to stay away from that. How am I going to stay away from alcohol? Alcohol is different from drugs. 
Knowledge you can kind of stay away from. Alcohol, every restaurant you go to, every home you go to, every party you go to, people are pushing you with alcohol. Oh, come on, have a drink with me. Come on, have a drink with me. How are you going to be able to quit doing that? Well, if it's going to be that type of environment, I, I would probably find it in my best interest to just leave. Well, you go to Christmas. Does anybody in your family drink? Extended family. In my direct okay. family, no, sir. All right. Okay. Thank you. That's all the questions. Miss McDonald, uh, would you please uh, introduce yourself and tell us what you'd like us to know? Um, yes, sir. Um, Deborah McDonald, Alan's wife. Um, we've been married for 17 years. Uh, <laughs> um, I just wanted to let y'all know that he does have an awesome support system. Um, he has a job waiting for him. We've all been, this has been hard on him, but I feel like harder on the, on us. Um, we just want him to come home. We're ready for him to come home. He was sober for a good two years before this incarceration. So I, I don't see the, I don't, I mean, I'm not going to say it can't happen, but I'm, I don't. I just feel really good about it. He's got a lot to lose more than he's ever had before. I mean, he's got his daughters with the grandbabies. He's got a lot to come home to. He's got a lot to be happy about. And he had a lot of rough times back in the day. We both had a lot of rough times, but um, things have been looking up. And I'm not sure sure what to say oh. <laughs> well, but you did very well ma'am thank you very much we appreciate your comments mr uh mcdonald uh how long have you been sober been sober since december 19th of 2015 was the last time i took a drink uh, is there anything you'd like to say to us before the panel votes? I just would like to let y'all know that I, I very much so have have learned my lesson. I know that you hear that every every day, uh, but I say it with a sincere heart. Um, I do plan on staying sober, and anything that I have to do to do that, I will do. Thank you very much, Mr. Bonner. I appreciate your comments, Mr. Freeman. Uh, does the staff have anything to say on uh, um, any problem? Uh, no, none. Since he's, he's been here, he's been housed here since um, May of 20. And he's followed all, all the rules within the facility, and he kind of has no disciplinary write ups. Okay, but, uh, when is he working? Yes, sir. Mike Jill, right. he's kind of running at Mike Jill. It's like a trailer, a trailer depot. They um, build, build trailers, flat, flat bed trailers. That's where he works. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. You're welcome, sir. <laughs> okay, Mr. McDonald. Um, you know, you, you, the alcoholism is probably worse than drugs, to be honest with you, because, like the judge says, it, it's everywhere you go. Uh, even going out to the woods like you're planning on doing, which I think is a great place to be, you know, it, it's still going to be around. Um, you have a, a very, very poor supervision record, and you have a long criminal history, and you're getting out in May of you know, April of next year. So at this time, I'm going to vote for the Thank you, Mr. Uh, Miss Miss McDonald, I am encouraged by, by what you said, and I believe. Of course, you know I believe. I, when, when you get freedom this time, you're going to be a different person. I believe you. But however, for me, my vote is to deny because uh, insufficient time served. You only served you know a little while in that 16 years. You have two prior revocations for DWI. Law enforcement opposed your early release, and the proximity of your good time thing, uh, and. And also, you have a moderate type. That's it. Uh, but again, I wish you well. I believe you. I want you to know I believe you. Thank you very much. Uh, 
advice. Uh, Mr. McDonald, uh, I, I've enjoyed our interview. Uh, you seem to be a, a genuinely good man. Uh, life obviously uh, is well, su well supportive of you, uh, but you've got a serious problem. And uh, as Mr. Freeman pointed out, alcohol in many respects is much worse than drugs. As a, as a board member, I have an obligation to the public. And as a former judge, I, I realize that person, as good as you are, if they make bad choices and get alcohol in their systems and get behind the wheel, they could be killing some. Yes, sir. And, uh, you indicated, and I think very honestly, you said, you know, one of the reasons why now I'm, 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 uh, I've got a different mindset is I'm looking at 17 years in prison. And, and I think in some cases that's a deterrent. And, and I, I think that, I don't know that you're there yet. I think you're very close to getting there yet. But, but I believe in my own heart that I need to keep you in jail for a little longer so you can feel the pain of what it would do to you if you do this again. So my vote likewise would be to deny. Would encourage you to learn as much as you can about your alcoholism and your disease so when you get out, you take advantage of the meetings, the sponsor, and the love and support that your family has. So good luck to you. Sir. Thank you. Um. Well, I don't have anything to share on this case. No court documents, no. So it's really just going to be <laughs> based off of uh, my own my own summary of, of of this hearing. And the first thing that came to mind for me was, you know, I mean, marriage is hard. Uh, I look through all the friends that I have had that have been divorced and, um you know, what is it like a 50% chance? And it, it makes me wonder how, how is it that, you know, all the credit to them, but to be so a spouse, to stick to your spouse, who's going in and out of prison, who's having these drinking problems, causing all of this chaos and to stick by them, um, you know, kind of, I hope he's counting those blessings. But I don't know if she's still sticking by him after he couldn't uh, instantly recite how long they've been married. Uh, Mr. Freeman put him on the spot right there. Now, I, I'd probably do the same thing. I'd say, you know, to be off by one year is not bad. But as long as he didn't miss the uh, anniversary date, right? Um, but shoo, I don't know how, how he'd do it. Now, he, he the judge really threw... The book at him and rightfully so 16 year sentence it's his sixth dui uh conviction it's you know you, you, we have seen enough enough parole hearings where where the person sitting in that chair has taken a life a life of a child a life of multiple children uh, while driving and you just say well why was he still on the road why was she still on the road and you know, this is going to be this, you know, he, his good time date is, is 4-15-2023, which means that he actually was released, you know, nine months ago. So it's interesting how these sentences work for these DUIs. You see the judge can give these big sentences, but the, the good time dates are not, are, are really just, uh, I don't know the math, but what is it i guess uh serving like eight percent of this sentence? no i'm not gonna i'm gonna butcher the math on this but it's like you know you get you get you get 16 years but you serve three and and i i get i get what they're trying to do they're trying to say look you're gonna serve real time in prison and then you're gonna have this uh huge sentence hanging over your head so this better keep you off the road but if he, if he gets in the, in the car and takes a life, it's like, 
who cares? Who's going to care about that? It's, it's just going to be like, why was this person again on the road? But, you know, I, I wish they would have done some type of stipulations that, you know, it's, it's almost like I'll parole you. You're getting out anyways in good time. So maybe parole. I don't know. I don't know the answer. I didn't think he had a good interview either. It was, it didn't seem, you know, he didn't have, it wasn't like he had a designated sponsor. You know, Mr. Mirabel, I have to go and pick that out of him. Well, who, who, do you know what, do you, do you know what number five is? And who do you talk to? Well, I spoke to someone there and I spoke to, I speak to my wife and to family members. It's like, don't you want to take this seriously? Shouldn't you have a sponsor? We have seen people show up to parole hearings who at least appear to take it seriously. They'll show up and they'll say, I have a sponsor. This is who it is. They'll say, you know, they'll say, I, I'm going to go to AA and NA three times a week. This is the address of the center that I'm going to go to. Um, and I just, I didn't see any of that there. Again, it's just someone who's like, well, I have children and grandchildren. It's like, well, you had children before. Maybe the grandchildren are new. But if your daughters didn't help you stay out of trouble, your granddaughters or grandsons aren't going to help you stay out of trouble either. And, you know, you could tell that he's feels remorseful and all that. So, okay, I agree with that. But I didn't. I personally didn't see where there's like this effort, this drive to to overcome this. And now this is his rock bottom. This is this is definitely it. But you know, there, there, I didn't see insight into why he drinks. He said, "Well, depression. It's this." But you know, where was the interest? But I. The good news is he's been out for what nine months, and we haven't heard from him. That's good news. Uh, that's good news. So thank you, Richard, for the info. I know that uh, you found what you could. And let's move to the next hearing. There's a second felony offender, offense armed robbery, sentencing date, March 16, 2001. Sentence to a total of 49 and a half years. Parole date, August 1st, 2021. Good time, February 8th, 2049. Full term, December 4th, 2049. Is this information correct, sir? Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Ms. Pearl. Thank you. <clears throat> Mr. John, uh, my name is Pearl Wise. I was assigned your case, so I'll be interviewing you first. How you doing? We're doing all right. Good. When did you first learn you'll be having a parole here? When I got a rap sheet. When was that? Do you remember? Um, I was like, I think it was in August. Oh, August of last year? I think this, yeah. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, August of uh, August of 20. Okay. Thank you. 20. <clears throat> Mr. John, uh, my name is. Hmm, we had an echo a little bit. And then we echo in the recording. Okay. So call out for the record how long you've served, sir, on this um, 49-year sentence. Sir, 21 years and eight months. 21 years and eight months. Okay. And uh, the records I have show that you have 300 days of programs. So call out uh, some of the programs that meant the most to you, that you've taken. That meant the most to me? Yeah, that you learned the most. Yes, sir. They had the most impact on you. Yes, sir. Well, all of them did. Okay, good. But uh, just the top three. The top three was um, financial, financial peace. Okay. Uh, serve, save. Okay, okay. So um, uh, Google. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. Um, let's talk a little bit about your about your crime. Uh, did you realize the age of your victim? No, ma'am. When did you learn that he was sixteen? When I went to um, trial. When you okay? Okay. What was going on in your life during that time? Well, I was young. How old were you? I was 24. Okay. I was 24. I really 
didn't know what I was doing. I was young at the time. Mm -hmm. I was a driver of the crime. But I'm, no, I'm still guilty because I was a driver. I still participated. Mm -hmm. I really saw what I did. If I would change by the hand of time, I could, I would. Mm -hmm. you know, when you're young, you make a lot of mistakes. And I just made a bad mistake. So when you said you were the driver, so y'all was riding around looking for somebody to rob? Yes, ma'am. Okay. So you knew what okay, so you knew what you were doing. Yes, ma'am. Okay. All right. I appreciate your honesty. I appreciate you saying that. I, I do want to uh want you to know that the victim uh was so impacted by that crime until even now, 21 years later, he don't want to say anything because he's afraid that you might come back. Uh, what do you if you had a chance to speak to your victim, what would you say? I'd tell him I'm sorry for what I did. Like you tell me at the end of time, I would. And uh, would you also tell him that that he don't have to worry about you? You're not gonna come for him in any way? Yes, ma'am. I would tell him that. Well, I need to hear you say it. If I, I see him. If I if I were to see him, I'd let him know that what I did when I was young, I was young. I'm older now, I got wise, I'm more responsible now. And I really want to tell him what well, I'm I'm sorry for what I did. And that he don't have to worry about you coming after him. You don't have to worry about none of that. No okay. All right. All right. Um let's talk about your last write-up. Uh it was for theft, January the 14th of 2020. I think it was um turkey wing cooking in the kitchen. Mm hmm oh, okay. And they said I'm um, uh, stealing turkey wing out of the kitchen. I'm I'm on um, meat cook in the kitchen. Okay. I found turkey wings in the oven and I got rolled up for it. Uh you the meat cooker in the kitchen and they yes, found turkey wings in the oven and yes, you got a, a write up of there. Yes, ma'am. Okay, connect the dots on me. I'm not getting it. I'm a meat cooker in the kitchen and I uh -huh. have turkey wings in the oven. And since I'm the head meat cook, they um I got the charge for it. Oh, uh, because the, the turkey wings were not on the menu for that day or what? Yeah, it was on the menu for tomorrow, the next day. Oh, okay. That's why I was trying to figure out, you know, why you got a write-up for it, but uh, okay. How many write-ups have you had in um, in these 21 years and eight months? I believe it probably was 66. Okay, okay. All righty. And uh Do you recall uh, refusing to take uh, sex offender classes? I don't recall that. You don't recall refusing that you were offered to take sex offender classes? Do you have a prior sex offense? No, ma'am. Okay. Where are you on the high set? I saw I saw where you were enrolled. Where are you on that? Right now, the, um, I'm not in, I'm not back on the high set right now. Yeah, yeah. You plan to get back in when the class is open back up? Yes, ma'am. Okay. So what do you do every day now in the prison? Well, now I'm still cooking. Okay. So when you got the theft, you didn't get removed from your job? No, ma'am. Okay. Um, you, you do have a low tiger score, and I do want to inform you that there is a law enforcement opposition and, and like I said, your victim uh, is just not going to make any comments. He, he does not want to make any comments. Oh, uh, Warren, do y'all see that where he was offered sex offender treatment? Or did I, I, over, I misread something? I was a little, I think it was in 2011, he was offered. And I, I wasn't, I couldn't connect the dots on that either. And I, um, I see you have your family here, but I read the letters from your uh, from your children, uh, from your sons. Yeah. Uh, did you get to see them? When they come to visit, I talked. Uh, I, 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 I was asking did you get to read the letters from your son oh, that no, they wrote. No, no, okay, man. okay. Oh, that's that. Yeah, that's unfortunate. That's unfortunate. Um, 
So if you're successful today, tell me where would you live and how would you support yourself? I'll probably go to New, I would go to New Road and I just get a job, find me a job, support myself. Okay. I'm, a, I'm a hard worker, a good worker, so it ain't gonna be nothing to find me a job. Mm -hmm. I gotta work at Walmart. I work at Walmart. Okay, because uh, but so you ha you have not had the opportunity to obtain a trade, right? You you haven't finished your high set, and you don't have a trade. Is what, what I looked in the records. So and you correct me if I'm wrong. You're right, yes, ma'am. Okay, all right. Well, how were you in school? Was school challenging for you? Somewhat, because I sat down to me cook, and I had to go on my off days. Okay, no, I'm talking about on the streets. Uh, what grade did you drop out of school? I think it was the 10th grade. Well, uh, do you remember why? Uh, I think I had a fight. Mm -hmm. I had a fight and I got put out. You just didn't go back, huh? Yes, ma'am. Were you in your right grade? Yes, ma'am. Okay. All righty. Um, Well, that's all I have. Thank you for answering my question, sir. Warren, what do you want to tell us about Mr. John? Ms. Wise, I'm going to answer your question about the uh, refusal, the, the refusal date that's coded 11-11-11-11 is a code where he didn't, that's showing he didn't need it because it says refusal, but that's he didn't need that class. It wasn't that okay. refused, right? Gotcha. Thank you. Thank you for yes, that. Thank you for that. Okay. And, uh, other than that, Fayola has been uh, consistently working in the kitchen, providing a, a service to the population, which is important here that um, we have to keep and maintain uh, consistency with feeding. Um, he's pretty low key and quiet, very, very quiet. Um, I see where in his disciplinary history, he had multiple hiccups back and forth, but he seems to always bounce back. But um, he does have favorable uh, marks from those who directly supervise him every day. Mm -hmm. And so I have nothing to um, nothing negative to say about him. He's not a, a tyrant at hunt. Like I say, he's been in that kitchen for many, many years. OK. All right. All right thank you, Warden. Uh, Madam Chair, that's all I have. Thank you, Ms. Wise. Um, we'd like to hear from Ms. Mary Shaw. Hi, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Hi, John. Um, so I am John's um, oldest sister. I am the the only girl of the bunch uh, from our, our mom and dad. Um, I live in Dallas, Texas. Uh, I'm an educator. I've been in education for over 20 years now as a teacher, as uh, a district administrator working with students who are uh, behaviorally challenged. Um, I've, uh, I have a background in clinical psychology and uh, currently, currently I serve as the vice president of RoboKind. We are a company that builds robots for autism. And so we work with um, school districts they're back home in Louisiana. I am currently in Dallas, Texas, where we're located. So my whole leadership team is uh, here to my right <laughs> um, as support as well. Ooh. But uh, what, what I want to say is um, it's natural for people to come on as family members to say how much they love their family member. That's a natural thing. I also believe, uh, as I tell teachers and superintendents around the country, that love for students who are identified as emotionally disturbed or behaviorally dis uh, disordered, those students need love and action. They make decisions at a young age that impact them as adults later on. And so one of the things that I teach is love in action. Love in action means having a plan, um, especially when you are being recalibrated, re-entered into um, society as a citizen, as a productive citizen. The change that or evolution that I've seen in my brother over the years from the beginning we were, uh, when he got in 
to now has been a very positive, taking my hat off as a family member, but taking my, putting my hat on as an administrator um, in education, I can see that evolution. Um, and so as, as a uh, actionable tool or, or uh, actionable bucket of resources, we as a family, and we're a pretty big family. Uh, you probably noticed there were nearly 20 of us that were trying to get the opportunity to speak here. But as a family, we have actions in place. Um, my dear brother Thomas has a, a security business, a very successful security business where John can work. Um, my dear brother, my baby brother, my other baby brother, since I'm the oldest <laughs> and the only girl, um, works in leadership at the company that he works for, um, where he started out as um, in pipe fitting, and now he's actually managing a pretty large team of people. Um, his company, Northrop Grumman, gives people opportunities like my brother John to get a job and make a living for themselves. So we have that opportunity. Um, there are opportunities, if you read my letter, that I have lined up for John to use his life as a light to students like the ones that I've worked with, the EDBD population that need to hear from um, inmates oh. like, like my brother oh. who have gone through. Um, Ms. Shaw, please conclude your statement. I'm sorry? Please conclude your statement. Oh, okay, okay. Well, thank you for letting me speak. And thank you for what you've done for my brother. Thank you, we, we do, I apologize for that. We, we just, time's constricted. So thank you very okay. much for your input. Uh, you, it's important Karen. for us to hear that. Um, Mr. Saylor, I think that's everybody who's indicated they'd like to speak in spite of the fact that we had 20, <laughs> as she said. Is there something you'd like to say to us, Mr. Saylor? Is there a statement? before we vote. Um, I'm just sorry for what I did. And if I could tell you by the end of time, I would. All right, sir. I think we're prepared to vote and we'll start with Ms. Wise. Yeah, uh, Ms. Mr. John, I, uh, <clears throat> I know you didn't, you know, you didn't know that uh, a day was going to come when you were going to be able to be released. Uh, and I appreciate the family support. Uh, but for me today, I would like to see you get that high set and get you a trade so that you, you won't be a follower uh, when, when you get out. And that, that right up in 2020 is a little concerning. I like to see a, a more consistent pattern. Uh, no more hiccups a consistent pattern of you not getting write-ups. Uh, and again, you have law enforcement opposition, uh, your, your, your disciplinary history, but I urge you to write back, reapply as soon as you're eligible for a rehearing with no more write-ups, you know, and, and work on your high set and, and a as opportunity presents itself. That is my vote, sir. Best wishes to you. Mr. Marabella. Thank you very much, Madam Chairman. Mr. Saylor, I want to commend you for the work that you've done. Uh, I agree with Ms. Wise. Uh, I think you need a little more work to do, uh, but you're moving in the right direction. So my vote today would likewise be to deny, but to encourage you to work hard. No more disciplinary write-ups and then reapply as soon as you're able to do so. Good luck to you, sir. Mr. Saylor, uh, you didn't realize you'd have the opportunity to come before a parole board early on in your sentence, but now you have that opportunity. So take advantage of the opportunity and listen to the advice of my colleagues. Um, I too believe you have a little more work to do. I, I appreciate the support your family is, is offering, but I think you have a little more work to do before then. So my vote today is to deny, uh, work on your high set, uh, get with the warden there, see if he can get you some skills training. Uh, reapply when you're eligible to do so. Stay right up free. Good luck to you, sir. Thank you. Okay, so we'll go over the facts of this case because, you know, as we often see in 
this isn't a jab at Miss Wise. It's just her style and her interview styles. We often don't really have a sense of what's going on, but thankfully, Richard has uh, provided the information so we can get into it and maybe get an understanding as to why he has such a long sentence. Uh, you know, and like they were saying, they didn't expect that he'd, he'd have a chance of parole, but because of Act 122, he does. Now, before I jump into that, I thought it was one of the few times I was quite happy to hear, um, I should say one of the few times, but I was, for, for, for the person in the background to say, you know, can you wrap it up? Stop talking. It's, uh, it was like, you know, it's, it's um, and then I thought that Miss Renata threw in a little bit of a zinger there when she said, uh, oh, and you were the only one to speak, even though you said there were 20 other people lined up to speak. Um. I mean, it, it, it's very sweet that he has a, a sister that is, you know, and it's quite amazing against the whole nature versus nurture thing because, you know, she seems to be a wonderful, um, successful person, right? So always, always fascinating to me. Let's go through the crime. Um, the record reveals that on June 5th, 2000, at approximately 8 p.m., juvenile JP was walking near his home near the intersection of Kismet and Eve Streets in Gretna. A black Dodge Neon occupied by two black males pulled up alongside JD. The passenger in the Dodge jumped out of the vehicle, leaving the passenger door of the vehicle open and activating the car's dome light. The black male who exited the vehicle was wearing braids was about the victim's height and heavier, uh, had a heavier build and had on a knit shirt with white, yellow, and blue stripes. He held a handgun, which he placed at the victim's head and demanded money. So, it, you know, we heard how Miss Wise was talking about how the 16-year-old is, is even too afraid to make a comment. Imagine being 16 and having someone hold a gun at your head. The victim explained that the only thing he had in his possession was a red key ring. I mean, it's just these guys literally jumped out of a car to rob a 16-year-old who had just a red key ring. I mean, the, just the the sadness in this, which he surrendered to the gunman. During the robbery, the victim would switch his focus between the gunman and the driver of the vehicle in order to determine the best time in which to attempt an escape. The area was illuminated by a street light located directly across the street, a porch light on the victim's house, and floodlights on a nearby garage adjacent to the victim's residence. The victim was about three or four feet away from the car, and because of lighting in the area and the vehicle, he was able to observe both the gunman with whom he stood face to face and the vehicle's driver. The victim noticed that the vehicle driver was a skinny black male with short shaved haircut and that he was wearing a dark shirt the driver looked around in an anxious manner as if to as if um to hurry the gunman at some point during the commission of the crime the victim heard the robber yell something as the gunman took the key ring from the victim and he took it right he lowered the gun from the victim's head seeing this is an opportunity to escape jb turned and began to walk away as he moved forward, JB heard a sound behind him that sounded like a gunshot. The victim began moving faster towards his house. Hearing the vehicle begin to drive away, JB turned to see the license plate that read C-A-E-S-A-R. I doubt that was a vanity plate, but is it possible it was? You know, the funniest thing is when you hear about criminals that have vanity plates. It's like, wow, are you that dumb? You want to make it that much easier for everyone to remember you? JB ran into the house and asked his sister-in-law to notify police that had been the victim of an armed robbery. With approximately 15 minutes after the call was made, the police deputy Albert Himmel and the Jefferson Parish office arrived at the victim's house. Officer Himmel took a report and a bulletin was issued on police radio giving a description of the assailant's vehicle and the two occupants. Officer Wade St. John and Jefferson Parish Sheriff's Office testified he was patrolling the area near the robbery when he heard the police radio broadcast. Officer St. John observed the vehicle meeting the given description located at the street of Batura Boulevard, proceeding north towards the West Bank Expressway. 
Officer St. John advised headquarters and thereafter stopped the vehicle and ordered the occupants out of the car. Inside the auto loaded black 25 bread was located on the floorboard of the passenger side. The officer also observed a large amount of U.S. currency between the driver and passenger seat. So can you even just try to think about this for like a second? Two guys that have weapons, that have cash, that have, you know, are going to go and rob a 16-year-old for a keychain. Maybe they fired at him when he left. I'm not sure. And it's all for what? It's just so idiotic, right? Like, you're going to all go. So now you can spend the basically the, the, the rest of your life in prison, lose everything you have. It's like, it's just, it just makes you, it just, you just shake your head. Deputy Himmel, who took the initial report, asked the victim if he would like to take a ride to the scene of this stop for possible identification. The victim agreed and was taken to the area the stop occurred. There were a lot of police cars, and the victim was asked if he could identify anything. Upon their arrival at the scene, the two suspects were located about 15 feet from Officer Himmel's vehicle. There, er, the area was illuminated with streetlights, and the lights of the patrol cars are shining on the defendants. Um, the officer asked him if any if the either two black males looked familiar the victim positively identified the two black males as the man who had earlier as many would earlier participate in the armed robbery jb was also able to distinguish between the gunman who was later identified as as ruffin and the driver who was later identified as sailor so remember he the guy who we just saw his interview was the driver um and not the uh and not the one holding the weapon the suspect was dressed in the same clothes they wore at the time of the robbery, and he also recognized the car. At the scene, JB was able to see the vehicle and notified the identif and noticed and identified his red key ring that was left on the seat of the suspect's car. The police placed the hangout on the trunk of the police vehicle, where JB saw it and identified it as a robbery weapon. Oh. This is, what is this? The defense called former co-defendant Ruffin. Ruffin testified before his jury that on the night of the question, Saylor was driving the car. Um, according to, to, to Ruffin, Saylor, who was not his friend, knew nothing about Ruffin's intent to rob anyone. Ruffin also testified that Saylor did not see the gun Ruffin held on the side. So his defense was, I didn't know Robbie was happening. I was just driving the car. Ruffin asked Sailor two or three times to stop the vehicle before Sailor complied. According to Ruffin, after this robbery, the pair was not riding around looking for another victim to rob, but rather they were going to bring Sailor home. Ruffin denied talking uh, to Sailor since their arrests. You know, it, it did check. Um, you know, I know Richard checked, but I was just curious, so I, I checked as well if we had his co defendant's parole hearing. But, uh, and to my surprise, Ruffin, R-U-F-F-I-N, is quite a popular name in Louisiana. There are four or five uh, inmates listed for parole hearings with that name, but not the first name. So we don't have his co-defendant's parole hearing. But he was found uh, guilty, as we know. And they threw definitely the book at him. Um, it... it, it, it it is a lot of time, and it is quite fascinating to me when um, when you see people sentenced for this amount of time in really a crime that he was the driver. No one actually got hurt, um, and he was, and this was, and he was only a second felony offender. Um, but they basically wanted to lock him up for 40 somewhat years uh, without a chance of parole. It's, I mean, it, it's kind of a life sentence. His, his parole date was 2049 until Act 122. And look, I'm not saying he shouldn't have gotten a long sentence, but um, to be sentenced all those years, 25 years, then plus the habitual offender charge, so he had 40 something years um to be to be to be sentenced as a driver in an armed robbery 
Um, it, it just seems excessive. It seems re really ridiculous. Um, that's just my opinion. I mean, you could have given a, a, a 20 year sentence with chance of parole after serving a certain amount of time and whatever. Hey, but so act one, two, two serves his purpose here. Now he had a terrible interview. They were basically saying, well, he didn't know he was going to have an interview until recently. So he hasn't been preparing for this day. And I think that this is one of those hearings that we can uh, take a look and remember to remember to appreciate when we watch hearings where people really do well. When someone shows up at their parole hearing and from day one, they just threw themselves at growing, at doing everything for the, you know, to, to, to actually be a better person, um, create, whatever it is that they do. We've seen those hearings where the person's like, has done amazing. And they were also in the same situation where they had no expectations of getting out there are they, many of them have life sentences without the chance of parole so i do think it's helpful to remember that hey some people do really make the best of it and then they are um awarded with parole and others who who don't are, are denied now he will come back with the chance of parole and he's just gonna have to do check those boxes mark those x's take the programs know how to talk about them properly and, and then yeah he'll hold Will get paroled but how successful will be on the outside that's a whole different story anyways thank you richard for the info and move to the next area